Okay, so uh, why don't we get started with the second part of our roundtable? And uh, personally, this is my favorite part of the whole roundtable, um, just listening to farmers um, pontificate um, and talk about what works and doesn't work. And um, I'm going to try to not talk too much because um, I really want this to be kind of an opportunity for um, people to ask farmers questions and for the farmers themselves to um, kind of talk about their story, um, what their challenges are, um, how their farm got started. Um, I think these are, these are really, this is, like I said, my, my favorite part of these um, workshops that we've been doing for a couple of years now. So um, we have kind of a, a slightly different format. We have one person here remotely and one person here in person. So um, we're not going to have as much maybe back and forth. Um, but um, so I'd like to give our first speaker some time and then our second speaker some time and then kind of try to see if we can kind of keep going back and forth for slightly longer periods. So um, it might allow um, a little more time for each speaker to have um, some time. Um, but our first speaker is Sarah Silva from Green Star Farms. And she's going to kind of talk about her story, um, show some PowerPoint slides, um, and then um, we'll click over to Ross Shoup from St. John Family Farm. So uh, thank you, Sarah, for joining us and start when you're ready. Hi, one, one, one quick note. All right, sorry about that, Sarah. I just want to tell everybody in the room that if you have questions, Sarah will sort of pause every once in a while and ask for it. We'll have to give around the mic, otherwise she won't be able to hear you. So that's how we'll just sort of do the, the logistics of questions in the room. So uh, if you have any, just wait for that opportune moment and I'll get you the mic. Sorry about that, Sarah. Now you can get going. Yeah, no problem. Also, um, I used to be able to see the chat and people raising their hand feature, but now that I'm in this screen, I can't. So if someone has a question, Yep, we'll, we'll take care of the online interface for you, don't worry. <laughs> All right, cool. So my name is Sarah Silva. Um, I'm gonna run through my slides probably a little fast because uh, often I find with these talks, it's better to have a, a dialogue between people because a lot of people have questions. Um, uh, I am mostly focusing on my pastured poultry. Oh boy, here we go. There we go, my pastured poultry operation. But in fact, I actually raised quite a few different animals on 85 acres in Sonoma County. Um, I do pastured eggs, chicken, pork, lamb, and goat all year. Um, I've been practicing uh, intensive rotational grazing for quite a few years now, uh, only improving as I go. Uh, the more and more I have focused on the improvements of the land, uh, the more profitable my business has been. It's also saved me a lot of time. So um, I will sort of touch base about those things, um, especially uh, I, I, I can't help but bring in the lambs because the lamb operation and goats have increased profi profitability um, quite a bit since rotating the animals. Um, I do mob grazing, so my sheep, my chickens, my goats, and my pigs, um, they all are mob grazed on the pastures. Um, the pigs do not mob graze in the wet ends of the winter, but everybody else does. Um, so yeah, th so that's my first slide. Uh, here's just a little <clears throat> summary of my enterprises at Green Star Farm. Uh, my lane, and this is all in order of revenue earned, but not profit earned per enterprise, just to give you guys an idea. Um, the lane hens and pigs, the lane hens by far bring in the largest amount of revenue um, and the pigs as well. However, the most profitable are more my broiler chickens and my lambs. Um, because the time they take to run is a lot less. I run about 2,000 laying hens a year. I bring in 1,000 every year and I take out 1,000 every year. Um, my pigs, I run anywhere. I, I harvest around 60 market hogs a year. My broilers right now, I've been running 2,400 birds a year. Um, that's, a, that's a seasonal project that I do. I don't run them year round. However, in previous years, I have. I've been doing this since 2008. So um, as far as the stages that uh, Dan was referring to, I'm definitely in stage five right now. <laughs> and, um, and always every year question my, why I'm still farming. I think that's actually a really healthy thing to keep doing. So um, I constantly try to make sure I, my, my, I have the right goals in mind. So um, as far as standards go, I'm sort of a little bit over the top with my standards. Um, 
You'll see, uh, I do have a budget here for just the poultry alone. You'll see my feed costs are high and for the poultry. And that's because I do only uh, give my animals uh, a soy free organic grain that's actually produced domestically. So the prices are a little high. Um, I do no-till drilling um, on most of my pastures at one time or um, not only this year am I actually going to be no-till drilling every single pasture on the 85 acres. Only gotten 25 acres done, but you know, here's to patience. Um, I uh, follow these regenerative agriculture dead, uh, guidelines. I have not yet done follow-up soil tests, and those are sort of my, my goals um, in this coming year. We've been really, it feels like it takes a long time just to get things set up. And, and even 12 years into this, I feel like I'm still sometimes setting things up. Um, but you know, it's, 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 everything is uh, a constant learning uh, thing. You'll have to excuse me, I have many dogs. I use livestock guardian dogs. So if there's barking all of a sudden, I'm gonna try to <laughs> ignore that. Um, all right, so my laying hen operation. I, um, in 2016, made some major, major changes to my operation. Um, you'll see in the lower right hand corner, the egg washer. That egg washer is a uh, national poultry equipment egg washer. It's just their, their baseline 5GS. Um, it does have a packing and sorting um, table on the end. That's what's on the left hand side there. That right there alone saved us so much time. We, we've always had the egg washer, at least since 2010. But the packing and sorting and grading part of the um, operation, that I think we were spending roughly four hours, sometimes between three and four hours a day washing eggs. That's a lot of money because it's not just hourly, it's workman's compensation in turn, it's managing those people, it's um, all the variable speeds people work at, literally putting eggs on scales. Um, so we, we upgraded to that. And in 2006, end of 2016, I bought my first chicken caravan. That's what those big boxy things are um, next to my hens. That right there, um, went, we went from four hours a day collecting eggs and washing eggs on top of four hours a day. So, I mean, it was an eight hour a day project just to run the laying hen operation. Plus I'm moving these things all the time. Uh, mostly that's me moving them, but, um, we were, uh, I now can skip a day collecting eggs. I only wash eggs once a week. And um, these, these have saved me time in such a way that now I don't even have full-time staff like I once did. I can pretty much run this operation by myself. In the peak seasons, I have an egg washer helping me. Um, and that's because I have been selling at farmer's markets. Um, I'm, the numbers are, I mean, I basically, cut my time in half or cut my time by a quarter at least. So, and so pretty much it's just my time. So now I get to just pay me and not other people. Um, my brooders are all in a barn. My broilers and my laying hens are all raised the same way um, as, as little guys. That's what that top picture is. I use hover brooders. If I've, and no one's ever heard of these things. I'll tell you, starting out, I use these and I've never stopped. These are just boxes. One box, one four by four box is a um, piece of plywood cut up with a heat lamp in it. I insulate them with the, um, the tech foil bubble wrap and each one will run uh, two to 400 chicks. So you'll see here, this is um, probably, probably about a thousand birds in this one. That's probably my laying head operation right there. Cause that looks like a six by four and a four by four box in that picture. Um, that's right there, how all my birds are raised. And the reason they're nice is cause the birds I really believe they're less stressed out because they're, they get that little mother hen box to hide in. Um, anybody have any questions before I keep going too fast? I'm, no. We're good. Can you hear me? Yeah, do we have any questions? I think you're good, Sarah. All right. Cool. How long are you keeping your, Sarah, how long are you keeping your chicks in those hover um, brooder right. pen? Right. So the laying hen birds, uh, well, with the, the caravans, I, I've been keeping them between eight and 12 weeks. Um, that's, the, that's the lane hen, those are the pullets. The broilers are always, well, okay, weather dependent. Usually three weeks, sometimes four weeks, depending on how bad the weather is outside. 
Um, I start my first batch in March, and if the weather's too wet, I'll keep them an extra week. Um, so really, feathers, till they have good feathers. I also have to free up a coop, you know, there's the logistics involved with the lane hens. Um, I bring in a thousand chicks, and then I take out um, the, the older birds roughly in the late summer when their production starts going down, and that's when the, hen, the chicks get to go out into the um, pasture. I have livestock guardian dogs. I have a lot of livestock guardian dogs because I have gu dogs to guard the goats and the sheep and the chickens, broilers and laying hens um, over the 85 acres. And because everybody's always moving about only about 25% of the land at any time is actually covered in animals. So you should, everything's grouped up and moved um, often so that, uh, you know, they, they uh, we, we have a lot of dogs <laughs> and I'm training a bunch. <laughs> Uh, so these are just some basic things to consider. Um, my one thing I can say that I've learned is try to start small only to learn how to do the very basics animal husbandry. If you actually don't want to lose too much money, figure out what your uh, the cheapest bulk feed cost you can get and go from there. Um, if you want to take it seriously, consider all of these things in startup costs, including your insurance, including workman's compensation insurance. Those are things people often don't think about. And I'll tell you, you don't want a workman's compensation claim. And you don't want someone to get hurt on your farm. It has happened to me. <laughs> I've been there. Um, let's see. Cheap refrigeration ideas, cool bot. I, we put together a cool bot. If you don't know what it is, look it up. It, you can Google it. Um, we built one of those in 2008, it is 2012, or 2012, we upgraded the room, I just insulated a little shed that um, I got, at the, like a tough shed kind of thing at the um, big box store. I've put one, I've upgraded it once with the insulation in the, since 2008, and we've upgraded the actual air conditioner once. And that thing has kept our eggs cool for a, what, what is that? What are we at? Two, two minutes. <laughs> so that is a really good solution for eggs. Not necessarily gonna work for meat, um, but it definitely is good, for, good enough for eggs. Um, there are low cost egg washing equipment and I would say definitely invest it. My first egg washer, believe it or not, I gutted a dishwasher took heating elements out of it, connected it to a stable heating supply, and washed my eggs that way. So there are ways of keeping your egg washing costs down, but doing it by hand is not going to do that. Um, <clears throat> all right, I think I'm going to go on from there. Uh, does anybody have any questions about the lane hen operation? I'm sort of going to go back and forth, but now I'm going to jump to my, my broiler operation real quick. Um, we have an Okay. We have an online question okay. about your mobile coop. coop. Um, where did you get it and how much did it cost and how do you move them? Okay, so this broiler, right? The, the I'm assuming it's the chicken caravan, right? Not the yes. Okay, I, I'm, I can't see, so I'm asking. Yes. Um, so this is a chicken caravan. These I actually imported from Australia. Um, I'm going to tell you the cost of these and then you're going to be like, whoa, it's, it's so expensive. But the truth is the amount of labor that it saved, it paid itself off already. I have four of these. Each one of these boxes you see in this um, image carries, um, houses 450 birds. I keep them open all the time because I do have the dogs. You can close these wings. I don't have a pointer, but there's like wings on the side. There's actually six different doors. Um, there is a, oh, unfortunately, I didn't include that picture. I'm sorry. There's actually a belt in the center of it. There are boxes around that belt in the center of it. And the hens jump in there and they lay their eggs and all the eggs roll down to the center. And if you look at the room, this door on the end, if you look where the, the I'm pulling it with a um, skid steer, that little door is the human door. And you get to go in there and stand up and it's been in one spot and all and, and on the belt there's a belt that you just roll all the eggs to you and collect them it is so nice when it's raining it's nice because i can skip a day of eggs if i need to um i mean the idea of being able to have a day off 
um, without having to pay someone to do stuff is sort of cool. Um, the eggs are cleaner, so we're not wasting as much time cleaning eggs, which is why I don't need an egg washer most times of the year because I can just handle doing them myself. Um, I um, th These are part of the reasons this these are so wor worth it. Oh, I didn't say how much it was. So this is um, one of these costs $16,000 shipped to your door in a big metal box from Australia. They do have a Texas hub, but to get it from here to Texas is actually more expensive than getting it out of the port of Oakland. So, I mean, there's just, it, they are really, they're a really great company. Um, I highly recommend them. The reason I purchased this particular unit was because I really want my coops to one day move on their own. My goal is to automate all of these things. They plan to work on automating this particular model, the 450, which they, it's called 450 because it's meant to house 450 chickens. Um, it has an anemometer in it. It has this thing called the Chicken Master that controls both uh, the laying hen nest boxes, which close at night so they stay clean. Um, it has a lighting system that it controls the anemometer pays attention to the wind speeds. And if these the wind speeds get too high, these doors will close um, just enough so that the birds can still get in, but the doors won't get whipped off, ripped off, or the coop won't flip. While I haven't had the problem with the coop, coop flipping, I've seen a couple of people who have. Um, and I don't think that was actually standard winds. I think that was a little bit crazier. A friend of mine just T-posts his downs because he's nervous of losing them. Um, I haven't had the problem. And we have some pretty gnarly winds out here. Uh, I'm over in the coastal area um, of West Sonoma County. Let's see. Uh, yeah, the the um, I I have a, some talks I did where I show all the evolutions of my coops. This is really the newest version, and this allow has allowed me to just pretty much not have to deal with staff. I get to farm now, which I really appreciate. Um, so the next big thing was my my mobile range coop. This is another coop I have. This is my for my broilers. Um, I tried to make get a couple pictures of this one. This is a 40 by 20 coop. It houses roughly 600 broilers in it. I move it every single day with my chick with my tractor that you see down in the lower right there. Uh, I haul my birds to squab producer from California in a, not that truck, I actually just recently got a new truck and which will allow me to double my production, but I do move them in those crates. Those crates you see on the truck carry 300 birds each. Um, if you were to go buy the little orange transportation crates, buying enough crates to hold 300 birds is more expensive than buying one of those Bright Coop crates. That's called Bright Coop. In the end of my slides, I actually included links to all these resources to where you could buy any of these things I have here. For a small poultry operation, if you really want to be serious, I really recommend getting something similar to a mobile range coop and setting your minimum at 300 to start as a batch. Um, of course, you should raise like 25 meat birds at least once. Um, I don't raise Cornish cross. I have raised pretty much every bird I can test out over the year. Right now, what I'm raising and I really love are the Freedom Ranger Color Yields, which is a fast, slightly faster growing bird than the um, Freedom Ranger. And uh, I'm finishing them in nine weeks. I could finish them in eight weeks, but I like them a little bit bigger. My finishing rates, my, my dress rates are anywhere from 3.3 .3 to four pounds. Um, of course, these are pasture raised birds, so there is a variance. My customers, I think, like that. <laughs> um, some of the startup costs to consider with the broilers. Um, my costs are all on 2,400 birds a year. That's running four, four different batches in one mobile range coop um, per year from March to October. One thing I will say is... Um, if I have used hoop houses from farm tech, um, the biggest problems with all my other versions, if, if you ever want to see those, I, if you, you could always email me offline, I could send you lots of pictures of all my different versions of coops. Some of them I'm selling if you want them. <laughs> but uh, mobile, the biggest problem with a lot of the other designs is leg issues. 
dragging them on the pastures have the mortality rates were very high not to mention the dogs i didn't have dogs then too so there was there's a couple different factors the only way the broiler operation has made money i we also made i, I used to run 11 joel salatin style coops when i first started i did that up until 2000 and uh, 13. I can't remember actually when I stopped now, but essentially we were spending so much money on staff moving those coops every single day that it wasn't making enough money only because of the labor. And then there's also the loss rate. I think we were lost somewhere around 20% of our broilers from, from chick to finish. Last year, um, I bought my first mobile range coop. Um, I, I upgraded from my hoop tractors that I had bought from farm tech. Really, I actually purchased them bullets at one point, we raised them with sheep, used them as sheep structures, put them in the chicken coops. Um, the mobile range coop cost, cost me only $6,000. I found it used. You can actually find greenhouse companies that will build them cheaper. Um, Polytex, T-E-X, is the manufacturer of the one that I purchased. You can buy them directly from them. Ship With shipping, I think they're somewhere around $8,000. Those coop, that coop, I, uh, my mortality rates went down to something like one to 2%. Industry is something like 5% loss. I wasn't losing anything, basically, as far as my standards were concerned. I can move that coop, feed that coop, make sure the automatic water is working, all in less than 20 minutes every single day. I did the whole 2,400 birds by myself last year. The only thing I needed help with was loading the birds into the coop, and that's only because I didn't want to I have to get up at 2 a.m. in the morning to do a harvest. I didn't want to have to uh, be spending my sleeping time picking birds. Um, so the mobile range coop, that large 40 by 20 coop, it's been a game changer, just like the chicken caravan, and um, really has saved me a lot of money. However, in order to get those bright coops to the slaughterhouses, you need to have a trailer or a flatbed. For two years, I've rented a flatbed trailer, a truck from Enterprise or um, Penske truck, totally worth doing as a as an interim solution. This year, I just bought my first 16 foot flatbed truck, actually like last week. Um, so I'll be doubling my batches. Um, I'm going to be buying one more MRC this year. Uh, let's see. Um, I think I'm going to go to the next slide. So oh, so here's a, a very okay. So let me explain this budget a little bit because it needs it has a caveat. This does not include my entire operation. You're seeing overhead expenses that are one fifth of my actual cost. You're not going to see my labor expenses here because um, in the end of October, 2019, we got noticed that our local slaughterhouse was shutting, shuttering its doors to the private community, which meant all my goats, sheep, and pig harvests, uh, the entire operation had to be redesigned. So I spent about three days depressed trying to figure out how to figure out to get animals to market. It didn't affect my design of my chicken operation, except that in order to really make good money at the farmer's markets, what I've learned is I needed to have fresh product of some sort every week. And that has increased my revenue, or my profits actually greatly. It's very, very expensive to get animals to market, to farmer's markets. So I had to figure out how I was going to do all of this extra traveling, which because now instead of being able to go 20 minutes down the road every other week to harvest my pigs, sheep, and chickens, I'm now traveling to Orland to harvest my pigs. I'm traveling to Dixon to harvest my sheep and goats. My only other alternative is Eureka. So, and I already <laughs> am traveling to Modesto for my lane hens or for my um, broilers. So this, everything had to be redone. So um, let's see, I uh, decided, where's the slide? So in 2018, 2019, these are roughly the way my numbers have been uh, in uh, as far as where my revenue has come. I will say that the farmer's markets were not as high about three years ago. And that's because at the time I was running anywhere from five to 8,000 broilers a year. 
but that was before I realized we were losing our, our money. We couldn't afford the labor it was taking to pay for those. The other biggest problem was the restaurants were paying the bills. I still have a restaurant that hasn't paid their bills from 2016, um, to give you an idea. They trickle in $100 here and there once in a while. It's very, very hard. I don't sell directly to restaurants anymore for that reason. Everything COD if you want to buy something from me wholesale, with the exception of our distributor. He, uh, our Feed Sonoma is our distributor, but that 23% there you see is from the distributor, that is mostly my eggs. A large majority of our eggs are sold wholesale and through the distributor. And the live animal sales, that right there, that's like selling what I do often. I sell youth blocks, um, my young ewes, uh, directly to mostly starting farmers um, at the right, right at the beginning of the summer. I try to offload those guys so I can really fatten up my um, my meat lambs. Uh, the other, other, I also do the same thing with my goats. So I get rid of some of the goats directly to uh, just as live animals. It doesn't seem like a lot, but for those particular operations, that was it's actually a, a good revenue stream. So back to the bad news in October, I basically decided to redesign my operation based on how I wanted to spend my time and not look at my revenue. <laughs> so I decided that I was no longer going to be doing farmer's markets because the cost of going to the farmer's markets was getting so high, having to do all this traveling. And I was already spending 24 hours a week just getting products ready and sitting at the farmer's market. So that was 24 hours a week that I could, I already, and not to mention I have to figure, had to find some time to um, drive animals to the hot, hot slaughterhouse. So um, gotta remember what slides I have here. Um, so now in 2020, uh, my last farmer's market is January 26th uh, this, this month. And uh, I, I'm, I'm calling it weekends optional for me because that means I, I may not have to work on weekends and feeding my dogs and throwing some, uh, collecting some eggs, I don't count that as work. So, you know, as long as it's not anything major, I might have some weekends off. For me, that's a big deal. I've been doing this for 12 years and haven't had many weekends. Um, so I um, decided to go all CSA. Now I'm gonna go back to that budget and that's because um, you're gonna see some numbers here that don't quite make sense. And that's because now this is only based on 2,400 broilers. I'll be doubling my production this year, which will actually increase my profits more because instead of doing one drive with 20, with uh, let's see, 600 birds, I'll be one, one drive with 1,200 birds. I drive my birds down to squab producers in Sonoma uh, of California. They harvest my birds. I pay um, Seaside Transportation, a refrigerated trucking company, to bring them back to my farm. And uh, uh, used to be we would take two vehicles down there and drive them back, but um, the cost of doing that made no sense because the, the um, partial truckload shipping is, is worth uh, it on, uh, you know, as long as you're shipping more than 300 broilers at a time, it makes sense. Um, I'm trying to look at these. Oh, I need to put my glasses on, excuse me. I think I should stop and see if anybody has any questions. Yeah, we have one question um, that I think hasn't been answered. Um, as far as keeping your chickens from getting diseases, what do you do? Do you treat them with antibiotics? No, I move my birds. I keep moving my birds. And if a bird doesn't look healthy, I call that bird and that's it. Oh, one thing I do do, I do have all my pullet chicks um, vaccinated uh, at the hatchery with Merrick. Um, the broilers are not vaccinated. They generally don't exhibit Merrick because of the pay. Um, so we haven't had, we don't find that it's an issue. I don't use, I use only organic feed. However, all my feeds are custom. I've worked with Modesto Millings in um, California for, well, ever since I've started for the past 12 years. And I have custom blends that I've worked with them. My broiler protein's a little bit higher. Uh, I can't tell you what it is because we just changed it. I apologize, but it's a soy, uh, it's a soy free protein, it's a protein. But we put oregano in um, and different herbs in the blend. And um, that really helps uh, for the birds. Now, 
some things. You don't, I, I'm very careful. I do, I do do the, the deep litter system in the broil, brooders. The broilers need to be moved out at before, a, no more than four weeks old, because if they do, then you're gonna start getting seeing health problems. I move my broilers every single day on the pasture. So they're always on a fresh, fresh piece of grass. I don't move my broilers over any um, area where the broilers have been in one year. So I only cover one space per year for the broilers. So they're never crossing over a place where the chickens, uh, even the laying hens um, have been. In fact, now I'm raising my broilers and laying hens on two different properties, so they're not even crossing. Before I would not run my broilers in an area where the hens had been, but I run my hens in the area where the broilers have been because I find the hens will break up the um, litter, the, the manure matter a little bit better it doesn't affect the hens, they seem to be fine. Um, I move the hens every couple of days. Um, the health of the animals improve as you pay attention to the health of your soil and your grass. And I'll tell you with my sheep and my goats, that has improved in such a way that I used to do an herbal wormer where I would give them it in their salt lick every single week. I no longer do that, and, and I do use a um, ivermectin when necessary, but I have a rule if anybody needs ivermectin more than twice in their life, they get called. So my flock over the years hasn't really needed that because I've, I have this, this rule. If, I, if you get it twice, third time, you're out. Um, so that's, that's one of my main calling um, procedures for the sheep and the goats. Uh, let's see what else is. Oh, and I also make sure that the goats and the sheep are rotated in such a way that they're never in the same pasture and there's always at least a 21 day rest before they rotate back um, and that 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 has helped in such an amazing way the, the the live birth rates are up and we haven't had to do any warming i mean i don't even have to buy that herbal warmer anymore it's it's fantastic so, any other questions so sarah this is maurice again um so thank you for that very detailed uh, kind of overview of your farm. It's pretty, very impressive, amazing. I'm exhausted just listening to your schedule. Um, before we go any further though, I'd like to have uh, Ross Shoup come up here and um, he's gonna just give a similar kind of overview um, of his operation. Um, I know Ross is, is relatively unique and I'd like him to, if possible, among other things, just highlight um, what he does with feed because I think it's a really interesting um, an interesting way to address probably one of the biggest challenges that producers have um, coming up with feeds that are cost effective um, because that's such an uh, expensive um, expense. So uh, Ross, thank you for coming and uh, feel free to take the stage. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ross with St. John Family Farms. We're in Corning, California and we just do layers. Um, we have 18 portable coops that hold between a thousand and fifteen hundred birds per coop and each coop is at a different stage throughout the year. Um, we have 40 acres that are irrigated pasture and we're unique in that we mix our own feed and we do a lot of our we actually do all our own marketing so we have a feed mill we have our processing for cleaning the eggs and doing that um, And the big thing that really saves us probably the most money is being able to mix our own feed. And you have to make that commitment if you're gonna be that large. But taking a step back, I think the most important thing you need to look at in economics or anything is before you even start is where's your product going? I know, is it Don or Dan earlier at the end said, you know, he didn't emphasize it, I don't think enough that you really have to have a home for that product. Because I've seen in the last couple of years, most of the rescues for chickens have been where somebody's gone out and started a chicken flock and then it comes time when they start laying and they have nowhere to take those birds so they just walk away from the birds. I think it was in Chico the guy walked away from 6,000 laying hens that were 18 weeks old. So prime production and they just walked away because he didn't have a place to send his eggs. So that is your number one thing you have to know even if you're doing broilers because we've done broilers and turkeys and you just have to know where that product's going before you even start. Otherwise, you're gonna put all this money into it and be stuck with it. And you're gonna have a hell of an investment. And that's, you know, 
that's a huge thing you need to look at too is your coops. I didn't bring a lot of pictures because I know I'm coming in 13 days. So I kind of brought that. And the economics to me is knowing where the product's going, but how can you minimize your cost? And your biggest cost is going to be feed, labor, and land or your, your capital expense. Um, our coops run, I started with uh, a smaller grid, about a 28 foot building on a steel grid so we can slide them along. And that runs us a, run, ran us about $16,000. And that can put, you can put 1200 birds in there easily. So you need to figure out how much room you have on your property to run coops, how many birds you're gonna run, which goes back to the big question, where are your eggs going? And that decides how big a coop you are but, or what. To me, we started with 600 birds and I was sitting there going, okay, I'm washing eggs, 600 birds. It's the only variable that changed was collecting and washing eggs. Feeding 600 birds or 1,000 birds, same amount of time. It's the washing and collecting. That's the only thing that changes. So you have to figure those three items out and then you can decide what you're gonna do or if it's gonna be profitable to get in the business. So then when you decide to do that, if you're gonna go in the business, now you need egg cartons, you need labels, you need boxes, you need distribution. Are you gonna pay the 35% to the wholesaler that's gonna put that on top of your product right away? Or are you going to buy a refrigerated van and do it yourself? We have two refrigerated vans now. The last one just cost me $85,000. But I deliver my own eggs. I know what's going on in each market. I don't have a breakage problem. And I'm not depending on other people depend delivering our product. I know all of my dairy buyers by first name. If there's a problem, they know they can call me. And that problem is taken care of immediately. I'm not going through a wholesaler hearing about secondhand problems, or this has happened here or that's happened there. So once you get that figured out, now how are you gonna wash your eggs and how many? I have a machine like she has from National Poultry Equipment, except it's bigger because of the volume that we do, but it works very well. The only problem is, is I've outgrown that machine. I need a newer machine that's a little more modernized. So we're looking at new machines for that. Um, <clears throat> So now that you have that in place, you got to get the eggs to market with your basically figure six months from the time you have chicks to the time you have eggs. And you're going to have three weeks of eggs that are small and mediums. What are you going to do with those? So don't, if you look at all the books, they won't tell you that you're going to have the small eggs for so long. And then at the end of the cycle, you're going to have big eggs, so they're not going to fit in the cartons either. So that's, <laughs> it's just very, very many variables that you're going to have to learn to live with as you go through this. I forgot, I skipped cartons real quick. I'm to a point now where I buy truckloads of cartons. I started out going to Modesto and buying small cartons, sticking them on the label or label on each carton and doing that by hand. And then it gets to the point where you're like, okay, I have enough birds. You got to save up the money to buy 20,000. That's the minimum order for a labeled carton. So I made a lot of trips to Modesto picking up unlabeled cartons until we got big enough to buy them. And, you, and luckily C Coast will help you with some basic label details and stuff. So you don't have to go to a graphic designer to do that. Um, So then once you get, um, let's say you get your eggs to the marketplace, what's the most important thing you want to do? You've heard the horror, horror stories or horror stories tonight about nobody getting paid. You got to find people to pay you. Luckily our receivables with all the stores and businesses we do less than 14 days. That's our cash flow. You've got to figure out your cash flow for making this go and you're in a cash flow is not, like I said, six months. That's what you need to figure once you put chicks on the ground. Six months until you get your first eggs. And money. What's that? My receivables. That means I'm getting paid within 14 days of when all my eggs are delivered. So basically, we 
we are in a very good financial situation with eggs or cash coming in. We're not waiting 30 days. I've done the restaurants. I've done it until it was, I blew in the face. And not only is pay long, if they close for a week, they change the menu. You may have a vegetable guy show up with, you know, a case of eggs and sell it to the chef for half the price. And it's like, oh, sorry, I got an extra case. I, I had that happen to me. I was going to this one restaurant and all of a sudden here's two cases of unlabeled eggs. And finally I said, what's that? Oh, well, you know, the guy brings us produce. He's doing chickens on the side now. And you know, these eggs are cheaper. Okay, thank you. See you later. So you always have that problem. You run into that problem at the farmer's market. So let's touch on farmer's markets real quick. Yeah, yeah, oh, okay. Um, what do you mean by coast that I'm not seeing the graphic? Oh, I, coast, or the question is, what is coast needs, why you need a graphic designer? Coast Packaging is the only company in California that will small, sell small amounts of egg cartons to small producers. And they're at, they're, Warehouse is in Modesto, but they're based in Orange, California. So I can, I'll leave the information. I think last year when I was here, I gave, they had that information. So that's what, that's what Coast Packaging is, sorry. So farmer's markets, we've tried them, they don't work. Because I can take my full van of eggs to San Francisco and sell that to a guaranteed stores in less amount of time then you go to one farmer's market in a day. So if you do the math just with labor, it doesn't work. Plus, if it's a rainy day, nobody's gonna show up and buy your eggs, you're going home with your eggs. Or if it's too hot. And the problem too at a lot of them now is you have the people doing produce and stuff are selling small amounts of eggs also for less. So we've got that. Is there anything else I can touch real quick? Because I'm sure there's more questions if anybody. Question, in the spike speak of the labels, do you have problems with the California state regulations? The question is, is do I have problems with the state regulations? No, because the Coast graphic designer has all the specifications that you need. So if you go through them, he will make sure everything's the right size. Everything, yes. And you sign off of it, you're still responsible, but they know what all the requirements are. And, <coughs> excuse me, I've never had a problem from the state regarding our labels. Okay. When we've been inspected. Uh, being inspected by them, by the state. They come once a month, they come in and check our packaged eggs, and there's no problem. We have no problem with them coming out. It's, a, it's an unannounced inspection and they come in and you know, we, they, they inspect our eggs based on our volume. And so we, um, we really don't have a problem. It's, you know, they run, they do nine dozen out of a case of 15. And if it's over, there's, you're allowed so many checks or so many dirty eggs or meat, what's called a meat egg, which is a spot in the egg. And if you have too many, you have to redo that lot. Or they can do the one-time exemption where they'll, they'll do an extra case. And if that case clears, then you're, they let you go and you pass. But it's very easy to have them come and inspect. It's not a big problem. Now, the one thing that with the state though, is if you have over 3000 birds, you have to vaccinate for the salmonella with the new program. So you have a lot of people that have decided that are under the 3,000 birds that are exempted, have an exemption on the salmonella vaccines. But for us, we have to do the water vaccines plus individually inject each breast of each pullet. So Ross, why don't you- I'll sit down. Come to there and we can- uh, Oh, a question? Move on to the next one. Hold it. So, uh, quick question, um, where do you sell your eggs? The question is, where do I sell my eggs? We go from the Oregon border to San Jose. So, you know, 
So it, just in this last half hour or so, you know, I'd like people to ask questions that they have of both farmers. And, and I'd like to start off just with kind of one kind of observation. Um, so we have two different farmers um, that have two completely different models. Uh, we have one farmer who, who does one uh, layer production and uh, has, you know, gone you know, full steam ahead into pastured poultry. And then we have another farmer who uh, the layers, broilers, uh, goats, sheep, pigs, I'm um, probably missing a bunch of other stuff there. So I, I'd like to ask uh, Sarah if she, if she was going to take one thing away or, or if she was going to get, um, she was going to consolidate and, and simplify, what would she um, get rid of or what would she focus on? And then I'd, ask, I'd like to ask Ross after that if he was going to add one thing on just in his experience of uh, going to farmers markets and, and interacting with farmers, what would he add on? Um, so why don't we start with uh, Sarah? It's a good question. So many years ago, it was turkeys. I got rid of turkeys. But um, more recently, uh, with the whole slaughterhouse thing, I've you know had to redo. Basically, I'm redesigning my entire sales um, plan. And it's looking like the pigs would be one that I'd have to really reconsider. It used to be one of my best um, profit margins, but because of the extra hauling of those animals and the increased cost to um, actually cut and wrap them, it, I would either shrink that program or completely get rid of it. There's another reason why that is, is it's the least regenerative aspect of my farm. It is the one that causes me the most loss in sleep when it comes to how do I make sure I'm improving the land and really doing the best for the animal too. And that's not always easy with hogs. You know, it's really, it's, they're tricky. It's a hard one because it's emotional as I raised, raised pigs since I was very little. So it's, um, it's a big deal, but it's today I've been having to really look hard at those numbers and, you know, selling them as the CSA shares, the pigs just, you know, it, it really makes more sense to just sell them straight off the farm. I know there's a very, there's a cap to how many pigs I can raise doing it that way. So it might be really scaling that one whole back. I've already also cut my life for my goat, but I mostly use the goat dairy as a side to feed the pigs and to help supplement baby animals. Um, I've cut that out of, uh, in the past two years out of the operation mostly because nobody wants to buy livestock milk. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm cutting farmer's markets because farmer's markets, the costs are just far too high. So um, looking at contract sales for the increased production in the broilers, and I, already I can already sell all my eggs as um, Ross mentioned wholesale, so that's not even an issue. It's the, um, uh, so yeah, I, I think that I, it would be, I think, I think it's really looking at pigs right now. I'm, I'm doing that. Okay, Ross. I would bring back the turkeys once a year. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that the, turkeys were very good for us and very profitable. So I would just that would that's an easy one. Turkeys. Um, we had pigs. I had forty sows. Um, pigs just tear you up. Um, it would just be turkeys. Bro broilers aren't worth it. You don't the slot the travel to slaughter is just too far. So. Eggs is very convenient for us, and I do turkeys once a year. <clears throat> so before I ask any other questions, are there questions from people in the room? I don't want to hog up all the time. If people have practical or, or other kind of uh, more economic, philosophical questions, I want to make sure we have enough time for people to ask our speakers what questions they have. Ross, you mentioned finding a home before it starts. How, how did you look for a home for your eggs? Oh, okay. Um, we were pretty fortunate that we, we've been doing this for 12 years. So there was a huge demand for eggs at the time we got in the market. So a lot of it came to us instead of us looking for it, where now the market's really saturated and one of the problems that's saturated is a couple of years ago the USDA came around and talked to us to give a definition of what pastured is 
Well, after two years of discussion, they decided there's no definition for pasture. You'll see the, uh, what is it, humane, whatever, has 108 square feet. But that doesn't, there's no definition that continues with that 108 square feet. All that says is you can put 20,000 birds in a big barn on 50 acres as long as they can go outside and you got grass or something on the outside. So it's really hurt us in terms of the mobile guys, which is what most of California um, pastured egg producers have. I don't know of anybody that has a permanent house, but if you go to the Midwest, they have these 20,000 chicken hen houses that open to the side and the birds can supposedly go outside, but they're not gonna go outside that often because the uh, feed and water's on the inside. Sarah, do you wanna take a shot at that also? Like, how did you find your, your, your customers? Uh, well, I started around the same time. So I think that eggs, eggs were just easy to sell then. Um, for the same reason. In fact, I had, we used to sell through Whole Foods and um, way back when Whole Foods would come out to the ranch and walk into our pastures and inspect our coops and look at the way we were raising them outdoors, seeing that the birds had full-time access to the outdoors. They did a really good job inspecting them. I don't remember what year it was now, but um, they're also a hard company to deal with because we're a small, Farm and we're like, well, we already ha we we have this many cases this week. We're bringing them all to you, and they still call us the next day, going asking for five more cases. And I'm like, I don't have more until next week. So that was a, spent a lot of time trying to make them happy. So, but anyway, um, and the same rules came down. We had companies from the Midwest asking us to sell eggs through them, and um, we didn't like that their standards would be different and. They were raising their birds differently and I didn't, I didn't feel it was the right way to group our girls together. And so we stopped actually selling to Whole Foods because they started creating this little very time, um, uh, timely, what is it? Not, was it, uh, it was like this application that we had to fill out about how many square feet our birds had and blah, blah, blah. And we're like, wait a minute, our birds are outside full time. I, we don't have a square footage per bird. It, it, define that. How many acres? You know, they they and so they were basically trying to give these barn raised pasture birds. I put quotes in there. An excuse to be able to put the 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 labeled pasture raised on their egg cartons, and that really bothered me. So I we only sell to small shops, um, but. I don't do any distribution. I don't do any delivering. It's all done through a local distributor um, called Feed Sonoma. They take all our, most of our eggs go down to the Bay Area on their trucks and are delivered that way. Then I don't have to chase individual accounts um, and we get paid. Great. Um, so before we go to another question from uh, the audience, um, so the next question I had, so just showing my kind of ignorance of the challenges of, of farming. One of the things that, one of the themes that's come up a couple times tonight and started with Dan was the challenges from a regulatory environment to becoming profitable. And I'd kind of like to ask each one of you, if you were governor of California, president of the United States, you know, whatever it be, what would be the, the, the thing that, that needs to change? What's the, the law that we either need to get rid of, the law that we need to put in place um, that would help you guys um, become more profitable? So why don't we start with, with Sarah this time? Well, that's really relevant for us with our slaughterhouse closing down um, or shuttering its doors to us. It would really be uh, uh, somehow lightening the load on small farms and the different regulations they need to go through for processing. It really should be easier for us smaller farms to process locally. Um, USDA certification is, is really difficult um, when it comes to the hooved animals. We can't sell anything by the pound unless it's been cut, killed, and wrapped in a USDA facility. The poultry, depending on what county you're in, um, you can kill the bird on your farm but only some counties will even allow that. Sometimes you have to get extra permitting. The state of California says it's okay, but when you go down to every single um, county and 
city. So I guess the answer would be somehow lighten the, either redu remove the USDA um, requirement for uh, some size farm that's small. I don't know what the actual number should be. Um, and just make it a, do state inspected. I mean, it could, there's just so many different options it could be. Um, and uh, that would that would allow us into markets in a, a way that we could actually, I, I wouldn't have to drop pigs, <laughs> let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we, we have to drop dry, we have to do a lot of stuff just to get something to market. Interesting. Very not cost of it. Russ. Good question, because you, you know, regulations are there because somebody has done something wrong. So you have regulations designed to take care of big companies and you have regulations that are forced on smaller farms or individuals that still are enforced on the bigger ones. So there's got to be an equality somewhere and just some common sense at some point where somebody can sit down or a group of people sit down and say, okay, we can make this work. We need guidelines at both levels, but how much more enforcement do we need at different levels? And it just to get it to be quality, that would be the big thing. I mean, I look at it right now as, you know, people that have less than 3000 hens can still put that their salmonella is safe. But those people with less than 3,000 hens don't vaccinate those birds because they don't have to. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's my gripe with the state all the time is why, you know, that's not fair that I have somebody in the store advertising and, you know, it's like, well, that's what they voted on. That's what they passed. So, but that's not fair to me as I look at it, fair to me or to the consumer that thinks they're buying a vaccinated egg, which in reality they aren't. Yeah, I always joke with farmers when I'm talking to them that either have 2,999 hens or just go like to 10,000 or so because that that spot between, you know, three and, you know, five or three and 10 can be kind of a challenging space to be in. Um, so before we kind of go back to any other questions, is there any other questions from the audience that uh, people have either online or in person? We might have talked about this when I went to your farm with my dad, but tell us more about like the feed and like since it's at different stages, there's that oh what you do with the well the feed, you know, basically we have um four or five, five combinations. So we have starter, grower. We call it 17 weeks and then we switch it at 38 and then we switch it at 42. So, you know, as a bird gets older, you get, you, they need less protein and they need more energy. So that's the unique thing. But what we're able to do is we mix feed every day, pretty much or every other day. So we can, if I know it's going to be cold for the next three days, I can add extra energy to the feed. I can adjust my energy. Um, when you go to buy feed from the feed store, all the feed, unless you're buying bulk and you get your feed custom blend, most feed companies are known as the backyard feed stores. They're making feed. Those rations you're buying from the feed mills are from somebody in the backyard and they're, they're just gonna give you the minimal. They're not gonna give you anything extra. And um, the story goes back to the reason I got into mixing my own feed is I had somebody sell me a truckload of organic starter and grower and I lost 7,500 birds in three weeks because it was only 12% protein. And the sad part about it is all he basically got was a slap on the wrist because he wasn't supposed to be selling the organic feed. It, it was just a mess. So that pushed me, you want economics and what saved me at that point? the 40 sows with the pigs. So the pigs kept us in business because I sold them all. <laughs> but um, you have to be really careful with your feet. Your feet can take you down in a minute. Three weeks ago, we got a, a new load of soybeans and my production dropped 30% in four days. Well, we use roasted soybeans. We don't use soybean meal and I have them roasted in Missouri. 
I'm waiting for the test results back, but I know the soybeans didn't get cooked properly. So it caused our protein. So I have a brand new roaster that we installed two weeks ago and our first batch went to the chickens last week. Our production's past what we were before in the winter time already. So economics can change really quick on you. And I've been through a lot. Is, is that an auger roaster? Yes. I don't remember the name, but. Uh, Dilt went out of um, Michigan is the one I got. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so if you want to know, just real quick roasters, there's a flame roaster for soybeans and there's also a, um, this is an oil bath that the, it's just the heat and the, it's consistent where a flame roaster will, the flames are inconsistent on the heat for the protein, pro, the, loosen the protein on the soybeans. And the one that I've been buying my beans from use a flame roaster. And I will bring beans with me on <laughs> the next meeting so you can take, because while we're on it, I'll just do, does anybody know the most important thing about your feed? Fresh. Well, fresh, but. No, how does it taste? If you can't taste it and eat it, why do you expect your birds to do it? Or any animal, you got to taste your feed. Yeah, it's cereal. That's all it is. I mean, roasted soybeans are actually really good. But if you can't taste it, how are you going to expect your animals to eat it? Same with your water. Taste your water. You know, I tell my employees if there's a dirty water, I said, hey, pick that up, take it. Oh, no, no, no. And I said, then why do you expect the birds to drink out of a dirty water? But yeah, when you get next time, I don't know if anybody has animals, go home and taste the feed. Taste it. See if it's got a mildewy taste or, you know, just what type of taste it has to it. I don't taste it. But see, if they're putting molasses in it or something, they can hide the taste. Did that in college. That's a feed lot. Yeah, it's, it's important. Okay, we have one uh, final question from an audience member. Uh, sure. Um, so this is from Ann Byer, our NCAP partner. Uh, if she, she says, if I remember right, neither of you is certified organic, even though you use organic feed, Sarah at least, and other preventative health and living condition practices. Comment briefly on why not. Was that question clear? Do you want to start first on that? Did you get that question? I did. Yeah. Um, well, I don't want to pay the extra costs. It's just um, I have considered putting my doing my eggs, but you know the truth is it's land is not permanent around here, and I am constantly spending time making sure I have enough land to farm on. And if I had to also make sure that land was also needed to be certified. That's an extra thing I don't need to do. The truth is I can't charge that much more for that certification. I get what I want from the wholesaler. So I, there's not been much of a reason to do the organic certification. It's just extra bookkeeping from what I can see. We are actually non-GMO project certified. So we use all non-GMO feed, um, which is actually, harder to be non-GMO certified than it is to be organic because with organic feed, you can just go to the feed store and buy organic feed that somebody signed their name saying it's organic. With non-GMO, it has to be tested and proven that it doesn't have any non-GMO in it. So that's one reason. You said any non-GMO? Or it can't have any GMO, I'm sorry. It has to be. So, you know, we, we have it tested regularly. Luckily, I only buy my corn from one supplier. They grow the corn and willows for me. So we take all the truckloads and test those in the fall. And then my soybeans come from one family in Missouri. Yeah, knowing your source is really important. A lot of people just go get organic feed at the food supply. And anyway, I, yeah, turkey. <laughs> and I'm living proof that organic feed can be cheated. <laughs> <laughs> so the the last quick question I'd like to ask, um, and and hopefully this kind of um, brings together I think a lot of the the stuff that we've talked about today. So 
I get the sense when I talk to farmers that pastured poultry in general, just economically, has very slim margins. And, you know, Ross was joking with me before the talk when I was talking to him on the phone the other day. And he was saying, well, you know, I'm just going to recommend that they don't go into business. He's, you know, these are beginning farmers. That, that's where they should start. And I guess the question I have for both of you is, is, was there a good old days of small farming, pastured poultry? Did we ever have that? Or, or, or are, we, are we in the good old days? We don't realize it. What, was there a time at some point where, where this did pencil out better than it pencils out now? Or is this just, just you know, a labor of love that, that is semi-profitable, um, but there's challenges and, and those challenges are greater than before? So maybe we can start with uh, Sarah and um, finish up in the next uh, five minutes if we can. I don't think <laughs> the whole days of farming. I mean, it's all has its ups and downs. Every scale, there's an issue. Um, I was, yeah, I, I, I think that it really, I, I wouldn't say it's not profitable, <laughs> it's profitable, but not, you know, you're not going to make millions doing it. I mean, not if you <laughs> at least I haven't figured out how to do it right and make millions. Maybe, maybe one day I'll figure that out. But um, the truth is, I think it, every single scale that I've had my farm at, there's, been, there's they all have its ups and downs. There's always a downside and a upside. So you know, I, I think uh, we could be in the. I think in our. <laughs> our, our, our Generally in Northern California, we're, we're lucky to be where we are because people appreciate quality food. Um, but, you know, so, so for that reason alone, maybe this is the, the good old days. <laughs> um, on pasture poultry, I think the sweet spot was probably six years ago, seven years ago. Um, I think, <clears throat> I think there's going to be some interesting things here in the next year regarding definitions for pastured poultry and eggs and you know everybody's kind of gotten fed up so <clears throat> i think there's an opportunity it's it's going to cycle around again um it just it goes back to make sure you have a home for your product before you start that's that's the whole that's the big economic question and answer is where it's going but i think there's going to be room especially if you can make it unique um, you know, it's a niche market. It was a very niche market for us for a good time. And we fought to have it stay that way. And now it's been commercialized and we're gonna fight back to get it back. And if you're ready and have a space to do your birds and have the niche and you're ready to go and have a good product, you can get into it. Well, with that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us.